everyone, uh, I'm Mona Dutt. I am the co-founder of Blue Analytics. Uh, we have been around since, I would say, early 2015, commercially available since June of 2016. <laughs> I know you, you mentioned dark data, and essentially that's a term, interestingly enough, I discovered less than two weeks ago because I looked at it in, in an article and I was very interested by what it meant. And it struck me that that's exactly what Loom works on. So dark data is data that's generated by businesses just in the course of doing business. Um, so if you looked at Netflix as an example, their, um, their viewer statistics are just a part of doing business. They always know how many people have logged in, how many people have watched which show. What they did differently was they decided to use it. To turn their business around and create more content that more people wanted to watch. So we had a money ball in which all these statistics were always generated. Like, it wasn't new, the batting statistics, the averages, the walk, the, the different terms that are in baseball, but the team decided to actually use those statistics, compare it to team winning numbers, and that's what they used um, used for hiring purposes. So what they did is they took data that was generally available. This wasn't new data being collected. They weren't changing business processes. They were really using the data that was at hand to turn around their current business models. So if you looked at Netflix, um, their early business model, for those of you that aren't aware, was literally DVD box rental. And so they took those statistics of who was renting what kind of movies, and then turned that around and decided that that's the kind of content they were going to push further when they went into the online business. And now they do such a good job of predicting the types of shows that would become hits. Orange is the New Black, House of Cards, they knew even before they put the first episode on air that they would be good. Because they knew the viewer statistics and the types of people that were watching those shows. And they knew that was their largest demographic. When we turn around and look at law, there's a lot of data that's generated, whether it's inside the firm or publicly. All the case law that's generated in the courts. When you think about legal research, at some level, you're actually performing analytics when you're reviewing every single case precedent. You might be doing it manually, but you're still making notes about which case falls into your bucket and which one doesn't. That is analytics at some level. It's repeated over and over again, law firm to law firm, associate to associate, but it's still analytics at the most core, at the, the, at the, you know, you break it down into its core processes. And so what Loom has done is looked at that process of case law and turned it all on its head so that we're looking at the patterns that are in case law. Are there things that lawyers look for repeatedly that we can mine once, almost like the software model, and serve it up over and over again? So that you save time on the research side, but then you start to look at the patterns that are in that data to take advantage of them beyond research. Are there ways that you can drive policy based on that, right? Are there patterns? in the judicial system that will drive policy, and I'm sure that's going to come up during our panel discussion, but also can you have hiring decisions based on that? Can you decide what to take to trial and what to settle based on the numbers coming out of the courts? So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about the benefits of analytics. I will flip to the demo for our live product. And then I'll go back and talk about the caution when you're using a platform like this or numbers to watch for the pitfalls. The basic definition of analytics, it leverages data in a particular functional process to enable context-specific insight that's actionable. In our case, we use the public decision set published by judges. And our insight is specifically court metrics. There's three types of analytics, descriptive. The, if you go onto a blog and it's the number of visitors, it's literally an aggregation of the metrics that are being collected on the system. Loom falls into that category. We don't do anything predictive in our system. We don't have any algorithms that predict the future. It's literally a historical representation of what's happened in the past in courts. <coughs> predictive analytics. We 
if you take the past and then you project that onto a statistical model and predict the future based on that. And I believe, and if I'm right, you guys fall into that, right? Blue Jay Legal falls into that space. So they've taken trends from the past and past court and they're projecting it into the future. Prescriptive is where healthcare and finance is going, which is there's things that have happened in the past, but I'm going to give you a decision tree that says if you do A, B might happen. If you do C, D might happen. So it's giving you all these options on how you can decide what to do. So those are the three types of analytics. And really in the legal tech space, right now we're sitting in either descriptive or predictive. If I looked at how <laughs> analytics would help in the legal space, it helps counter biases. So a lot of what we um, do when you're, talk when you're doing decision making in a law firm would be you'd go to the guy next door, in the next partner or an associate, and you'd ask them, well, you had run-ins with this judge or with this counsel on the other side, what do you think? So their experience is what limits your opinion or your knowledge of what you're going to face in court. Instead of having the time to be able to go out and do a survey, of, like a completionist survey of what it is like to be in front of that judge or against that counsel. Availability bias. Again, same thing, right? You ask the closest, your closest group of colleagues about an opinion. Overestimation of success. We tend to believe we can win more than we might. Right? It's, it's that belief that's driving us that, yes, we can do it. And we see that often with the, one of the demos I'm going to go through is going to be a summary judgment motion. And you'll see that there where in an appeal to court, a summary judgment motion isn't something you can, flip, uh, you can overturn very easily, but people still continue to do it. The numbers aren't small. So an overestimation of success. And then jurisdictional trends, knowing where the court system is at. And we'll talk about that more uh, during the panel discussion, but there's a few biases that it helps counter because it gives you the big picture, complete view of the landscape. It lets you go from approximates to quantitative and measurable. If a client comes to you and says, what are my chances of winning and losing? It's better to be able to say to them, historically, your case has won 70% of the time, or your case has settled 70% of the time for X number of dollars versus saying you have a 50-50 shot. Giving them a reality check because they might choose to settle instead of going to court and going to trial. Um, in case triage during intake, if you knew as a contingency lawyer that you didn't have that much of a shot at winning anyways, would you take the case? Some people might. Some people might choose to take a tough case, but not everybody might make that choice. But making that informed decision more efficient and informed research. There's a big issue, uh, at least with big law, and it's in the states already, where clients are refusing to pay for research time. By 2020, it's estimated that research time will not be billable time. So they need to make it faster, quicker, more accurate. And case scheduling metrics, including decision publication time. So one of the things Loom provides in one of its reports is response time. So the time that you were last in front of the judge for your motion or trial to the time it took to publish the decision. <coughs> Project management, being able to give your clients a reality check. Can they wait six months for a trial decision or are they better off settling? Because sometimes it might be the fact that they need the money quicker. <coughs> A pictographic view of what Loom does. Um, so we are taking unstructured case law, open text searches, and structuring it. So the first part of our process literally is we've got lawyers on staff that go through every single case coming out of the courts. We've got Ontario, BC, and Alberta, uh, including its appeals court. And we, we have lawyers and data entry staff who will go through and extract every single trackable metric out of the decision down to the court file number, the decision date, judge, the court name obviously, the counsel, the names of parties, everything that has to do with the decision that you can possibly put on a measurable metric. Um, we track what type of motion or trial it is, who won, who lost, 
In some cases, it might not be a clear win or loss. In that case, we would actually track it as a split if people asked for one thing and got part of it. Um, and then we <coughs> aggregate all those results to provide finished metrics. As an example, uh, if you were to compare, <coughs> compare to traditional research tools, you, if you search for summary judgment motion on an open text search tool, you might get a lot of noise. Uh, but when you compare to Loom, because we track the type of motion, who won, who lost, who the responding and moving parties were, so your research set becomes really, really focused. So instead of having to start with, let's say, a hundred decisions, you might end up with just five or six. And that's what you focus on. Focus on. Again, you might want a bigger set. You turn off some of the filters and you start to broaden your search. I'm going to go through the demo really quickly just to stay on time. Um, so if you logged into our system today, uh, it's commercially available. Anybody can sign up for an account. There's a seven-day trial um, just to get you guys started on it and get an idea of what the system does. So this is what the login page looks like. It's continually evolving, but this is what it will look like at least for the next two months. Um, if I went in and I looked at the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, full available date range, an open-ended search, we've got three different types of advanced reports. One is more akin to what you're used to, open-ended case list. This, is, this groups by outcome, and this gives you turnaround time. So if I did an outcome search, These are the results. So it's very tabular in that it gives you any party, it gives you a numerical list of what's going on. It'll give you a graphical representation followed by the latest decisions and wins and losses. So if I was to narrow this down just so that it makes a bit more sense, um, if I was to do uh, employment law trials, So I've got 92 trials that won, 62 that lost. Again, it's Ontario Superior Court of Justice, 2010 to present. Okay. You can click on any of the outcomes. So let's say you're the moving party or the plaintiff side. You can click on any of the, any of the out, uh, outcomes if you were one of just the wins. You get the decision list. You click on a decision. You get a summary of the way we have sliced and diced the data. So we've got lawyers on staff. This is exactly what they've extracted. A little bit more, but we've presented everything so that it's not a black box. It's very clear where our numbers are coming from. It gives all the different hearings that showed up in that one decision. And then if you click on the PDF, it actually gives you the body of text. So you've got that flow so that if you actually wanted to eventually get to the case law, you can get to it. <coughs> Traditional tools, you might start directly with this, and then you're sitting there and reading through and trying to figure out what's going on. So that's a quick glance at one of our reports. I know I've got to watch the time, so I'm just going to flip back to. Oh. You're pretty good. Yes. Yeah? Seven minutes. Or so. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to flip to the demo very quickly. Actually, here we can go through a few slides of the. Just going to go through a few screenshots of. Let's say you wanted to further drill down and see outcomes by a specific judge. You can actually choose the judge in in Refine Search and really start to see the numbers, right? This is for summary judgment motions because the screenshots were done for a different motion, but you could compare that to an average trying to really figure out. In some cases, people might say, well, we don't know the name of the judge up until two or three days before, but that's fine. That's even better. At least it gives you a, a good idea. So you prep irrespective of judge, but you start to refine your arguments as the day comes closer. We deliberately chose to actually create a mobile app as well to support this, because we often hear from clients that say, um, 
By the time I know who the judge is, I'm in court. I don't have time to flip open my laptop and log into Loom and figure out what's going on. We've got a mobile app that gives them the basics so they can choose the judge, choose the type of motion or trial, and can give them the results. And then they can still go through that full chain, but it's a limited version of the, app, of the desktop experience. And we are cho choosing to actually, from a design thinking perspective, by end of October, the whole desktop experience will be mobile usable. So you can log in by the end of October on your phone and actually use, on a browser, use um, Loom as if you were using it on your desktop. It'll look a bit different because the real estate isn't all there, but it's, it's going to be usable. I'm just gonna flip through. The decision turnaround time report. So it summarizes turnaround response times by judge for a specific type of motion or trial. So you can go in and look at publication times. You can then go in and say, okay, this is Justice Morgan's average publication time. What is their publication time specifically for the type of motion or trial I'm dealing with? So you can start to give your client maybe a reality check of what's better. Do I just get a summary judgment motion and take the risk? Or do I even take a summary judgment motion? Because if I lose, that's how much longer I have to add to when I can get scheduled, start scheduling my trial. So from a project management perspective, that helps. Track metrics. To date, we've got facts, type of hearings, the outcome for each hearing, um, judge analytics, party details. What we're starting to add in now are costs and damages and counsel analytics. While we do track counsel, we have been sensitive to the fact that uh, Clients don't take too well to being graded. So <laughs> it's, it's the reality. And, I mean, I, every time I speak in front of a group of lawyers, it's like the room lights up when I bring up counsel analytics. And so they're happy to see other people's numbers, but they don't want their own share. Describe what would be what information would be available for counsel analytics. So, you know, like Makina has some stuff for their. So it would, it would literally be our metrics. So if, if instead of just looking for win loss by judge and right. by fact you would have the pick counsel okay. or you can see counsel A in front of judge B how do they fare or counsel A versus counsel B how do they fare and with, if you if you add party details into that because we're we track the party names but we won't allow um, individual searches because from a privacy perspective it's not it's not kosher to allow individual searches so what would happen is corporations so let's say um, the municipality of the city of Toronto um, versus a bank where Council A represents the city of Toronto and you're in front of Judge B. So really starting to turn it almost into a chessboard, right? With all the different players and how they work. And so the potential for that is huge. It's just some people, and I believe rightfully so, say that the performance of a lawyer in court doesn't define their quality because a good lawyer would normally settle before they even get to court. And so that is sort of the argument. So we're trying to really figure out where the balance is before we start to expose that data. So that sort of goes into the ethics part of it, which is you might have access to all this data, but what do you expose and how do you present it so that it's a fair representation of what's happening? Simple math operators, like I said, we don't have any predictive abilities now for several reasons. Um, so it's something that somebody can manually replicate if needed. Uh, we have had discussions with researchers in the space who've confirmed that our numbers look right for some areas that are very well researched, including summary judgment motions. So one of the things that I brought up before, we don't ever provide just numbers, right? We, we clearly spell out um, what cases fed into those numbers, the decision profile spells out how those cases were tagged, so that if there's ever concern about the quality of the data, clients can bring it up with us. As an example of um, you know, how to use the numbers responsibly, so Loom will as an example, give you summary judgment motions, let's say it's 2015 to present, where present in this case was, I believe, around July that these numbers were pulled out. If 339 hearings were won and 196 were lost, it's very clear what the percentage is, and the numbers are fairly large, right? Now go down to the Moreva injunction, which is a very rare motion. Numbers are there, but look at the numbers. It's three and three. 
That does not mean that in the future you've got a 50% shot of winning. So actually looking at the data set that's feeding in is very important for lawyers when they're consuming the data to make sure that they're making responsible extra extrapolations from it. It's okay to go back to the decision and see what the arguments were in the winning and losing cases. But do you then assume that you're gonna win 50% of the time? Maybe not, because from a statistical perspective, it's a very dangerous assumption to make. This is a quick difference between statistics and analytics. Analytics is used for certain types of statistics. It may include statistics. It's not necessary that it will always include it. In our case, it doesn't. It's not big data. Canadian data isn't big data, not from the courts. The US data might border on it, but just the volume of Canadian litigation doesn't get to big data levels at all. Uh, we have no AI in terms of predictive abilities. Um, it's an empirical quantitative tool. It's completionist in that our data set is what's published. So that's a big difference between those of you that might be familiar with the US system. They have something called PACER, where all decisions go into it. The smallest to the highest court decisions that are covered by PACER will all go into it. With Canada, judges have the, the discretion of whether they want to publish their decisions or not. So that's why I like to put this up to say red is what Loom covers. We don't cover French because I have no French speaking lawyers on staff. But the light blue is the entire data set. And that size is unknown. Because if we don't know what's not published, we can't truly tell you what size of, like, what the size of our data set is in terms of a percentage of the sample when we don't know the full data set size. But that being said, for decades, decisions are made based on published case law. So that hasn't changed, right? This, this has always stayed the same. Published case law is all you can quote. Published case law is all you can cite. So when you go into court or you're preparing, that's all you can work with. And what Loom does is really aggregates that pub published case law into a consistent uh, format. If you compare Loom to, for example, a decision census, um, and we saw all saw how that worked out um, with the elections in the states, it's at the end of the day, census and polling are used to make decisions, are used to extrapolate for policy. Right? It might be slightly off, right? but they are still used to extrapolate for policy. The types of people that don't respond to a census will probably slightly bias the results. They do for, for population census as well. Unless people that, you know, everything's mandatory now, if everybody responds to it, that's different. But in the past, a census has been used to make decisions. So in the same way, an analytics tool can be used at least to make basic litigation strategy or even um, business decisions for law firms if they choose to start really looking at the data. Limitations, things to watch for. The confirmation bias, it can even happen when you're looking at large sets of data. You see what you want to see. So let's say the results are in front of you, there's factors that go into it, um, for example, this case, does it really make sense? You know, raw tomatoes in Judaism, egg rolls in dog ownership. The numbers might say something. That doesn't mean they have a causal effect. So really knowing where the numbers are coming from and what causes have what results <coughs> is important when you're looking at the numbers. And then, even when the numbers are there for you, what if this happens? Right? You've got a situation where female litigators fare worse. Will firms stop sending female litigators to court? I think it's important to really recognize the risks of what data might present. That's not to say not to use it, because at the end of the day, it has it, the, the benefits far outweigh the risks. But actually recognizing the risks and making sure you account for them is important. 
that's pretty much it from me. Um, this is a quote I really like from Ed Walters. <laughs> Data will have your hunch for lunch. And it's true. With, with the legal space, I've seen it. Like, I have actually gone into demos and asked people how they think courts do and how judges do. And in some cases, their gut instinct is confirmed. In other cases, it's completely, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's completely different. And so actually having the data is important. Being able to at least have something and so just going to the client and saying, well, you have a 50% shot. It's based on my experience or it's based on a number I pulled out of thin air. I just data. Right? Whether it's your private data or public data. Like some of you guys are law students and you will go out there and some of you will go into big law and some of you will start your own firms. <laughs> just being conscious of how you collect the data so that you can actually use it in the future for decision making would be very useful. Right? As when you start a new firm, you have the opportunity to set processes from the start, from the get-go. Thank you. Thank you, Mona, for allowing me to skip over everything and avoid the risk of saying the wrong thing. I won't hear you to speak about this. I learn something every time, and I hope you will too, because uh, 100% right. I've got some pretty pictures at the end. Most of my pictures are ugly. Um, because I'm talking about this from a slightly different angle. Uh, as uh, Professor Salzen mentioned, uh, my background is uh, through Canly. I'm working with uh, VLEX uh, slash Compass, and we'll tell you a little bit about who that is. But it brings my point of view to this discussion. Uh, I begin at legal research, the concept of legal research that you learn in school, that you apply in practice. And so that's why I'm approaching this. Uh, first, where did VLEX come from, uh, VLEX Canada come from? Uh, some people in the room might have heard of Maritime Law Book. It was an independent legal publisher, uh, began in Fredericton in 1969, began publishing Nova Scotia and New Brunswick decisions, largely because nobody else was. So Mona talked about dark data. Legal information has been dark data for a long, long, long time. Uh, if you wanted a decision of the New Brunswick Court of Queen's Bench, you might have had to wait a year to see it in the Dominion Law Reports or longer in some other reports. So, Maritime Law Book began. Uh, it gradually spread over all English-speaking provinces, basically everywhere outside of Quebec, uh, although they did do a handful of Quebec decisions as well. Uh, they were one of the early technology innovators, launching mlb.nb.ca in February 1997. That was actually, in Canada, the first time a legal research platform was available on the World Wide Web, a commercial legal research platform. Uh, Quick Law uh, at the time was available through a private network. As you can see, my little curve shows an up and a down. Uh, Maritime Law Book reached a point in its management of information where it said we, we simply can't go forward. Uh, they had a uh, very expensive process. A decision would come from the courts. One of several uh, extremely experienced editors would look through it, decide how to apply it within their taxonomy of 150 legal topics and 48,000 subtopics, figure out where it goes. Um, while they had moved digitally early, they didn't innovate very well there either. So in uh, mid-2016, uh, they said they're, they're simply going to shut down. Uh, that's when I came in. Uh, they had something that is extremely important. Uh, two things that are extremely important to anybody trying to do something with legal information, be it analytics or any kind of competitive offering. They had all of that historical information, and they had a relationship with the courts to continue to receive new decisions. So with uh, some technical partners, we bought uh, the assets as the company went down and launched Compass.law. On December 1st, we rolled out our service, had over 100 lawyers and law librarians across the country testing it, seeing what the, could be done with it. As you can see, it's going to die this week. Uh, because it, despite the advantages that came from buying uh, into a business with a pedigree, we were still a startup. We hit some startup bumps along the way. Fortunately, uh, we found new friends. Uh, VLEX Canada. VLEX is a company that began in 1999 with the standard legal tech entrepreneur startup uh, uh, story. A lawyer who said there has to be a better way and someone close to him said, I know how to build a better way. They happen to be brothers. And so they launched a uh, legal tech startup in Spain and gradually uh, developed their services across uh, Latin America and have been moving further and further afield. 
So in June of 2017, we launched uh, VUX Canada Open, a free legal information uh, platform using all of the maritime law book data as well as all the new cases that we've been getting from the courts. Had all the great uh, features and tools and so on that VUX had made available to their other jurisdictions. In August, we launched VUX Canada Premium, uh, which includes additional information, with additional tools and functionality. So that's where we are now. Uh, another party I didn't mention in this at the bottom of the, uh, uh, Justia. Justia is uh, a company out of California that puts legal information online for free. Uh, started by uh, Tim Stanley and Stacey Stern uh, in 2003. Those same two people, husband and wife, in 1994 created Find Law. So they were one of the earliest legal information on the internet groups. So we are very pleased that they've come on board as investors in RBX Canada. And uh, uh, Tim has come on as a uh, board member as well. Now, back to legal research. Um, legal research looks like this. Somebody tells you that somewhere in the library, in the computer, in a pile of information, there's an answer. You have to find Waldo. They may not even know he's called Waldo. But somebody will say, there's a thing that said something like this. I'm pretty sure it happened in 1993, possibly 2012. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to go find Waldo. So, uh, everything that's been happening in the legal tech space for the past 10 years is about trying to make it easier to find Waldo. Would you like to point to this? Ah, here we go. Um, we need to do this, and this is similar to uh, one of Mona's pictures, because what we have is a big pile of data. <clears throat> we have random cases, we have sections of statutes, we have documents that describe the point of law here and there, and we have to find a way to turn that uh, data into information, into knowledge, into insight, and ultimately into wisdom. But this is currently beyond the scope of most legal technologies, uh, despite the fact that it's not beyond the dreams. This is, again, the reality that we deal with. Uh, <laughs> we rely on expert systems, but for the most part, those expert systems tend to still be people who are very good at things. Uh, but in the future, we all think we're heading in this direction. We all think we're moving to an omnibot future where uh, if the information uh, exists in the system, we'll be able to take it out of the system through unstructured questions. Um, as Mona showed you all, it, it's not quite that simple. Uh, this is information that either may or may not be in the system, and if it is in the system, it may or may not be tagged in a useful way. Uh, I have a lot of uh, respect for the people at, behind Ross and anybody else who uses IBM Watson. I think there's... <laughs> there's huge there's huge leaps that are possible, but they're nowhere near the dreams that we have right now or the, or the expectations uh, that we think people are benefiting from. So it brings us back to, well, what do we know? And to do that, I'm going to revert back to my friends at VLX in Spain. So as a, uh, as a company that competes with Tom Reuters head-to-head in Spain, they're a, a full purpose or a full suite legal service uh, competitor. They have everything you need. You can buy their products in 50 different ways. You only want criminal, you only want labor, you want to do uh, a complete thing with statutes and codes, uh, or you just want cases, you can buy that. They also have analytics. In, uh, in January of this year, and I'm sorry for the small pictures, I, I, I did this because I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, in January of this year, they released an analytics product. Uh, so, uh, all of the tagging that goes that goes into that effort, they have done with Spanish legal information. And so they've created court level analytics, judge biographies, details of uh, cases and, uh, and penalties, outcomes of cases, and all of this is interlinked within their analytics system. So if you happen to be looking at judge biographies, you can then click over to, well, what was the last three judge decisions from this judge? And if you're looking at those decisions, how does that compare to the timelines? Uh, for that judge or for that court. You can get to it geographically. You're going to cut this many, many different ways. Uh, they've been taking on roughly one commercial, new commercial client today, uh, this year, with this platform. Not by selling it as a standalone app, but by selling it as an adjunct to the normal legal information research process. The idea is 
there's a big learning curve that users of legal information have to go through to get to the point to benefit from legal data so they can jump into legal analytics, get an answer, and, and move forward. But often you have to sort of nudge them into this idea. You have to make it adjacent to where they're at, at, uh, at home, where they're comfortable. So that doesn't necessarily mean sitting in the library stacks or sitting next to the librarian uh, just chirping out stats every time somebody looks at a piece of information. But the way VLX has approached it in Spain is that we have clients, we have a business, let's see if we can move them, move them along. Makes them a little bit more valuable in terms of uh, their core business to their customers and it gets them ready for when the broader market is interested in this. They have not moved into some of the things that Mona was talking about about uh, uh, predictive analytics. They have not moved into the social commentary as uh, it could flow from having all of this tagging. They're contemplating how to approach that right now. Uh, VLX uh, operates globally. They have uh, about 120 million documents uh, from over 100 countries. Uh, one of the cool things that they do globally is they allow for simultaneous translation uh, in your search. So one of my favorite sample searches is Apple, Samsung, Design Patents. These are two companies who are suing each other all around the world. So if I want to look simultaneously in multiple jurisdictions across multiple languages, VLEX allows me to do that. And by the way, there are three Canadian universities that have been subscribers to VLEX Global uh, for the past few years, and this is one of them. So head to the library, look this up, have fun. Uh, this brings us back to Canada. Uh, one of the things that we have included uh, in our content set is the legal magazine Slaw. So this was perfectly timed that the uh, headline article was the struggle is real because for us, it doesn't matter that VLEX has built uh, fantastic analytic tools in Spain, we don't have the data in the format that we need to in Canada to take advantage of that. Want to subscribe the process. It is arduous. It is a serious uh, lift to get there. So we've been focusing on things that we can do. Um, our content uh, can be searched by topic. Uh, access to all of the, oops, put those in the wrong spots here. Uh, summaries and topics, text digests and so on, lots of information where people are looking for it. Uh, the tools include things like the ability to uh, highlight, annotate your content, links to related uh, services, folders, favorites, and follows, everything you want to do while you're doing traditional research. So again, we are approaching this as a company not from, we're an analytics company, we're offering these cool things. We're walking into a space where Canada is used by 90% of the lawyers in the country. The two big commercial services are used by roughly 50%. So there's a huge gulf of legal professionals who need something on top of Canada to help them move forward. So that's how we're entering this market. And then we're going to try and do new cool things. Um, this isn't live on our site yet, but we we're developing uh, relational graphs of every case that you've ever looked at. And then we're giving you the ability to filter it down. The idea here is we're saying you're looking for a particular topic. You found a series of trees in a forest. We're pointing out trees that you have. <coughs> uh, some of the things that we have already implemented uh, are similar case recommendations. So maybe you've used our topic search or found a particular case in some other way. Uh, we're telling you, by the way, this case over here doesn't have a relationship with your case through citations uh, or through prior topic tagging, but we will run it through you know, various deep learning algorithms and determine that these are highly similar. And what do I mean by highly similar? I mean this. We've developed the semantic distance by looking at uh, the words, the sentences, the phrasing, the, the overall structure, and then created uh, a numerical measurement of the distance. So point zero 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 would be an indication that these are two nearly identical documents. Point one would be an indication that these documents have absolutely nothing to do with each other. So what we're doing right now is figuring out where the sweet spot is, where the information of similarity is useful and where it's not useful. So we think right now that's point zero zero five. Uh, more time and effort will, will tell. But this is where we're coming up with suggestions. So this is one way that it's not quite analytics, but it's nudging a traditional user into a data-driven decision-making or data-driven research process. Uh, I've got two pictures overlapping each other. On the upper left, in our US product, 
Uh, we have what are called smart topics. Uh, through tagging that was done with the content there, you can follow particular topics, labor, finance, criminal procedure, what have you. On the lower right is our attempt to take topic tagging that we have right now for certain cases and extend it. So Maritime Law Book, with their editors with decades of experience, created this fantastic taxonomy, but in their uh, efforts, half the decisions that would come into them, they would look at and say, that's probably not important. You know, it didn't wind up in a physical book, so it didn't get the, the full editorial treatment. So using things like semantic distance and other tools, we're developing uh, measurements to, to predict uh, what else is subject to, or what else could be classified under the same topic. So uh, luckily we have nearly 200,000 things that are very well tagged, so we take a subset of that, use that as a training set, create some rules, and then test the results against uh, things that we know the answer to and see how, see how the algorithm performs. So we've, we've gone through the first couple iterations of that, identified reasonable cutoffs, uh, where if there's a 72% probability <coughs> that this is dealing with practice or 85% probability this is dealing with family law, um, is it a high enough and a good enough result that we're going to put it to a user when they're searching for family law or torts and so on. So we've done our first cut and then so we're now fine-tuning the algorithm and we're going to push it through again. What's next? Now I'm returning to the general topic. Um, what's next is uh, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. Uh, I stole this picture. I wasn't good enough to create my original as Mona. But it's the same thing. We have a pile of information. What are we going to do with it? Right now, we, we, we're a research-driven, a research-focused company. But we need to do something with this information. So we want to move ahead because there are a lot of people um, at the research company level, whether it's Thomson Reuters, Lexus, us, Bloomberg, and others who are doing this, and there are uh, significantly more at the, uh, the startup uh, and data-driven level that are looking at this inf these information sets and building tools on top of it. Uh, one of them is run by uh, a criminal lawyer in Hillsborough County, uh, actually technically Tampa, Florida, uh, Sam Harden. Uh, he launched a tool a few months ago called Legal Optics. This focuses on impaired driving. He's uh, gone into uh, a very narrow area geographically and topically and pulled out a ton of information because it was very easy to access. His challenge wasn't uh, the difficulty of getting access to the data, it's the difficulty of getting access to the same data across multiple jurisdictions. The tool of legal optics allows lawyers, users, uh, the public and others to see the results of particular cases uh, in impaired driving at all stages of the matter and the performance of the lawyers at all stages of the matter. Uh, through his process, he's graded the lawyers as an A, B, or C rating based on their general performance. And so someone can go in and see, is this lawyer an A lawyer, B lawyer, or C lawyer, depending on their performance, uh, find out again all the stats about uh, what are the odds that if you are this lawyer in front of this judge at this time of day, <laughs> what, what are you going to face? Uh, so there's um, a significant number of companies, larger and smaller, throughout the U.S. that are trying to do something like this. But there are two problems. There are two things. Um, Mona's identified one of them, and that is we don't have the data. Um, my favorite example uh, of this is speeding tickets in Ontario. Uh, in any given 12-month period, there's between 580 and 600,000 speeding tickets issued in Ontario. Uh, section 128 of the Highway Traffic Act. Now, if you try and find cases on that, you will find five <laughs> during that same 12-month period. So what is the law, and what kind of, uh, how, how does the law apply to Section 128 of the Highway Traffic Act? We have no clue. And the second uh, problem that we have to deal with, which is where I'll close, is ultimately we're still dealing with humans throughout the whole process, including the judges. So, we have to keep pressing forward. We have to keep doing the best with the information we have uh, because we know it's the right thing to do. But there's going to be some challenges on the way. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Toronto and uh, I teach contracts and law and economics, an exciting subject like that. I'm also a co-founder of uh, Blue Jay Legal and as Amy says, uh, we are bringing machine learning to the law and when I tell people that they get incredibly scared and they, uh, they think about uh, oh, technology. Uh, oh, oh, there we go, that's me sufficiently close. They think about robot lawyers. And they think about robot lawyers coming to take, uh, take your jobs as lawyers. Um, there's been a number of articles on this in the last few, the last few years. Artificial intelligence seems to be some sort of buzzword going around. Um, I, I, Colin actually called it a dream, I think. Is that right? There are dreams of, um, of robot lawyers. I think for most people here, it's probably a nightmare. Um, this is not going to happen anytime soon. I'm here to allay fears. This is not going to happen anytime soon. We're not going to have robot lawyers running uh, cases. But we will be using data, as Mona and Colin say. Uh, we will be using data to help her inform and to streamline legal research. And that's exactly what we're doing at Blue Jay Legal. We have partnered with uh, Thomson Reuters to provide a couple of different products that basically tap into data to provide uh, ways in which legal research can be streamlined. Uh, one of those products is descriptive, one of those products is predictive. Um, when I started uh, law school 20 years ago, this is how we were taught to do legal research. Uh, we would have to go to a book in the library and get little tags and check out the book and it, the, it, the system was all very archaic. We moved around that time to a system of uh, digitization and now we're moving forward with the search, the research at the moment, the research tools at the moment are a bit clunky. You, there are better ways to structure the data. We do have data in law, and there are better ways to structure it, and that's our goal here at uh, Blue Jay Legal. We focus on narrow, specific issues. We don't try and map out the entire law. We focus on very specific issues, and we take all the data we can on those specific issues. So I just want to uh, do a little hypothetical. This is a law school, after all. Um, this is a music teacher. Uh, let's suppose, that's not a tax lawyer, that's a music teacher. Let's suppose that you are a tax lawyer. Do we have any tax lawyers in the room? Even if there were, you wouldn't put your hand up, would you? <laughs> okay, let's suppose you are a tax lawyer. Let's pretend. Uh, and your client is a music teacher, and she works at a music school, and she wishes to know whether she is an independent contractor or an employee for tax purposes. The consequences uh, are enormous. Uh, Depending on the answer, for example, if she's an independent contractor, she can uh, take out more. She can. Uh, she's entitled to way more generous deductions than if she was an employee. If she's an employee, however, she's entitled to all sorts of benefits. The question, basically, in some sense, divides the tax code in two. She comes into your office. She tells you her story, and what do you do? How do you find out the answer? I'm going to open it up to the crowd. How do you find out the answer? Whether this, she's told you her facts, she's told you what the contract is, she's told you uh, how much she teaches. How do you find out the answer? Read Burn Krishna's book on tax law. Read the book on tax law, right. And then where would that take you? That will take you to a case called, well, you, you, then you go to Westlaw, and you can find a case called Weed Door, which is the leading case. A 1986 case from the federal court, and it spells out that when you're answering this particular question, are you an independent contractor or are you an employee, there are four things that you need to take into account. That you look at something called the total relationship test, an incredibly fuzzy standard that has no bright line rules. It's a fuzzy standard. There's four, it, it's, I love these words as a law professor, it depends on the facts. It always depends on the facts. The law is governed by this very vague standard that takes into account the four, what's called the four we door factors, which is how much control is the hirer exerting over the worker, who owns the relevant tools, where is the risk being allocated, 
is the worker integrated in the business or not? There's been a fifth factor which has been added um, and uh, is of questionable uh, relevance, but that is, what does the contract actually say? These are the things that courts look for. They look to evidence how much control. They look to evidence where the risk lies. They look to evidence who owns the tools, etc. What we've done is uh, we have coded cases. We have put structure on all the cases in line with how judges and lawyers think about these issues. And think about how to think about what the relevant facts are. And I'll come to that in a minute. Traditionally, what you would do is you would take Weed Dorp, the 1986 case that sets out these precedents. You might even look to some more recent federal court cases. Then you would try and find some similar precedents. You would probably use search, uh, keyword searches or something like that. There are, just since 1997, over 600 cases that deal with this very specific issue. Just this very specific issue. 600 cases uh, heard at the tax court. How are you supposed to rifle your way through all 600 of those cases? It's a tremendous hurdle for lawyers to find the most relevant cases. You could search for music teacher, but the contract would be different, the control level might be very different, the integration into the music school might be very different. You want something that's similar on a whole bunch of different dimensions. And so we ask the question, is there a better way to find the most relevant cases for your particular uh, case? And we think there is. And so we have this product called Tax Foresight. We're partnered with uh, Thomson Reuters, as I say. We have this product called Case Finder, which it basically allows you to uh, get at the most relevant cases in a whole bunch of different narrow issues. I'm just going to run through one, but we have 14, 15 different issues already. We're keeping it and we're extending it month by month, and we're branching, these are all tax law cases. We're branching into employment law later this month. Let me just show you how Case Finder works, um, how we structured this data. So you would go to our worker classifier, our worker Case Finder rather, which has all 600 cases from the tax court. It has all the cases from the federal court as well. And what we've done is we've broken it down, find cases by outcome, find cases by court, find cases by year, find cases by the intention of the parties as the judge decided it. Find cases by who supervised as the judge decided it. Find cases by who is setting the agenda, who sets the hours and schedule, find cases by whether they have the freedom to delegate, whether the worker has the freedom to delegate or not. Find cases by who owns the tools. You can't do this with traditional um, legal research methods. This breaks it down into the, the legally relevant facts. So if I wanted, and I'm not suggesting that you should do this, but if I wanted to find out all the cases where the court said, independent contractor, I immediately get a list of every single case where the court said independent contractor. I want employee cases, I can immediately get every single case where the court went the other way. You can't do that with traditional uh, legal research methods. What happens if I want to find cases where employee was the outcome, but the contract was one between the music teacher and the music school, was one of an independent contractor relationship. It's a quite common event. What we would do is we would click on independent contractor relationship, and it would tell me all the cases where the outcome was employee, but the contract was independent contractor. And you can narrow down, you can drill down further and further to find cases that are most relevant. So for example, if I wanted to find uh, cases where there's an independent contractor relationship, but the hire owns all the tools, I can do that. I can do that, I can do all sorts of things. I can find cases by who sets the hours and schedule. These are all cases where all those three things are checked off. That allows you to narrow down and find the most specific cases. The way that lawyers think about it, here are the relevant facts for lawyers. That you can search by these relevant facts. That's our first product. 
The second product, uh, so that's the descriptive product. The second product is more of a predictive product. We have data on every single case in these narrow issues. We are not, um, we are not doing every single issue. We are doing the big issues that get litigated frequently. And we are focusing solely on these narrow issues. Prediction is everywhere. Where in any job that you will ever do, you will, as a lawyer, predict. Without using computers, you will do it. This money ball for lawyers, money ball is a prediction game. They are trying to predict who is a good player. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. The scouts use their hunches. Oakland A's using data, more data than uh, the other teams. There's uh, a, a number of studies have shown that algorithms, very simple algorithms, outperform humans when it comes to prediction. Even the simplest algorithms. This is a picture, I know it's not a great picture, but this is a great picture, <laughs> this is a picture of a college guidance counselor and a student. And a few years ago a study was run where they tried to predict, they got the college counselors to predict the ranking of students based on a 30 minute interview and they were, the college counselors were given all the data. They ran that ranking against the actual ranking of how, uh, how the students were ranked and they used a very simple predictive algorithm that just used two things, their SAT score and their GPA. That simple algorithm outperformed the college uh, guidance counselors markedly. The same is true for almost any industry. If you're a doctor, algorithms are um, uh, getting better and better. My uh, fiance is a radiologist. We're very concerned about the future. If you are working in uh, approving loans, can you imagine how quickly your bank would go out of, of business if you were relying on a hunch? I think this guy's really going to pay the, pay the loan back. <laughs> when people use data. Uh, people use data because it's a better predictor. In insurance, if you had an insurance company where people relied on hunches, you would soon go out of business. Use the data. Uh, we are using very simple machine learning algorithms. We are using very simple machine learning algorithms that learn the best way to predict given a set of data. Um, we're using very simple ones, and we are trying to predict the outcome of a case. You give us all the facts of your case, and we will compare it to every single case that has gone before it, based on this, simple, on this one single issue. These predictive tools in machine learning, they're used in self-driving cars, they're used in Google Translate, this is the most amazing thing of all time. They are used in facial prediction. Does anyone know who this man is? No? Will Farrell. Will Farrell, thank you. Does anyone know who the man on the left is? That is Chad Smith, the drummer from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They look kind of similar, right? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you can tell them apart, maybe you can't. The question is, can we use machine learning to tell them apart? And the answer is yes. What we do is we feed a whole bunch of pictures into an algorithm, a whole bunch of pictures of Will Ferrell, a whole bunch of pictures of Chad Smith, and a whole bunch of pictures of Jimmy Fallon, and you can predict. All this is, is a prediction of, what, of, of whose face that is. That's all it is, it's just a prediction. That's what facial recognition is. Everywhere we are seeing predictions, and machine learning is used to provide better predictions. Can we use these simple machine learning algorithms to uh, make a lawyer's task easier? The answer is yes. Um, we use the 600 cases as the backbone, but there's more data in cases than just the outcome and the facts. There's information that judges provide, an overture, there's all sorts of different information that we can use to help predict. Let's return to our client's case. All that you, is required is you go onto our system and you fill out a, a survey that takes about five to 10 minutes. You answer all the relevant questions, you go into our classifier, you go into our worker classifier, 
You answer some questions about what it is the job is, music teacher, music school, contract here is an independent, uh, independent contractor relationship. You answer some questions about supervision, answer some questions about who determines what work is done, about hours and schedule, etc. About who owns the relevant tools, where the risk of loss lies, where the work is done, etc. You answer these questions and then it compares yet that case, that vector of information, to every other case that's ever been decided. And says, well, this is an 88% chance that a court would come out on the side of this being an employee. And you can provide some description as to why this case is, according to our system, not a difficult case. It points strongly towards employee. It, it points out the major factors that are driving this decision. It also tells you the most similar cases. And you can click on these cases. And if you click on that first case, you'll see that a case called Menodarchus is actually a case about a, um, a music teacher who was working at the Rockstar Music and Co uh, School and Concert Hall. Uh, and it turns out that she was an employee in this case. You can go through the other similar cases as well. This one I think is uh, I think it's a ballet school. No, that's a music business as well. You may be looking at those questions and say, well, people might disagree about the facts. It happens all the time. You read a case, you'll have one set of facts, and then the other side has another set of facts. You can use the system to test both sides of facts. So the music school might say, oh, I guess you said, um, you said, let's say, that the tools were owned by us. No, sometimes the guitar teachers bring their own guitars in. So let's change it. Let's change it to both instead of the school owning all the equipment. What about if we allow it so that the music school might say, the music teachers have so much freedom. Yes, we give them some guidance, but they have so much freedom as to how the work is done. So let's change that to yes. Even changing those to the, employee, the, to the music school's best facts would leave this as 74% employee. And here, it's not a not a not difficult case. Now it's likely that the worker is an employee. Uh, either side of the facts, it looks like it's an employee. Uh, we have lots of different classifiers. This is not the complete suite. These slides are a touch old. And as I say, we're moving into employment law, and I'm more than happy to talk about employment law as well. Um, but that is it. Uh, descriptive. Descriptive. Thank you for the framework. Um, and I'll leave that. Thank you.